good evening and welcome to this uh, session where uh, we will be in conversation with shashi desh pande over her memoir listen to me uh you you are all very familiar with shashi's works which you have enjoyed these uh, works have been uh, um studied by academics but now uh, what you will get to see is the obverse of the coin and in listen to me um uh, we follow shashi on her journey of how she became a writer there are many incidental things we first begin with her journey in growing up in the small town of dharwad growing up as the daughter of the eminent uh, kannada playwright shri ranga uh, a life which um, may not be uh, may appear quaint to many people these days because it was rich in creative pursuits in uh, uh, intellectual thought in discussion where she acquired a love of reading very very early then her education in bombay where uh, she was the innocent abroad motherhood marriage and um finally shifting um to bangalore from bombay side by side what we see is the growth of the writer the formation of a personality of political opinions of a literary sensibility a view of life which expresses itself in her fiction uh this is a book that doesn't pull its punches about indian writing in english but at the same time it is a book of gratitude it is a book that expresses gratefulness to the writing life for giving her the opportunity to reflect upon matters very close to her heart and to write about them in the ways that she knows best that is through her fiction uh this is a very honest book it is also full of humor a certain kind of self deprecating humor uh you can tell that this is a very uh, self aware person a person who takes her writing seriously but who regards herself with a light touch so well i'm sure all of you are uh, waiting to read it and i hope the conversation that we have this evening will uh, wet your appetite for it uh i want i will uh, begin the conversation vivek and nancy i i want to i'll be, begin with the first uh, question to shashi i want to preface my uh, question with a small bit from the memoir so that uh, the audience too can get a feel of uh, uh, the writing i joined basel mission school because the school had a library a grand name for what was just one locked cupboard in a senior classroom opened by the teacher in charge during lunch hour on library day almost at the same time a library came into town the karnatak granthalaya my father had taken a leading role in getting this library for the town i remember my sister and i going round collecting money for the library One day when we were on our collection rounds a woman who opened the door of a home we knocked on told us go home gandhi ji has been shot dead there could be trouble the library and gandhi's death are inextricably connected for me i can remember how we raced home breathless panting and found a crowd of students who had come to listen to the announcement on the radio and my father sitting in a chair a handkerchief covering his wet face the whole of the next day our house was crowded with students who came to hear the commentary on the funeral i can still remember melville de mello's rich baritone laden with grief 
and the utter silence in the room. Um, uh, Shashi, even as, as far as the reader is concerned, these two images of two uh, young girls at, at a, I mean, a life far removed maybe from today, you know, at an innocent time going around trying to make a collection. And this is, um, uh, you know, you have juxtaposed with a momentous historical event. And I would say that your writing too is, this would be true of your fiction as well, where you have a personal story on a small canvas, say a story um, centered around the family, and you have a, uh, your ideology or you would say the political event would be the background which contextualizes it. Now, you were born before independence. You, in your book, it comes through that um, um, you were very much alive to the early years of euphoria, of independence, of the building of the nation, of Nehruvian socialism, and you developed very, very strong uh, political thoughts and ideas. Now, today, when we look at the literary environment around us, it is, say, it is the big book, uh, the epic story, the state of the nation novel, you know, the bow wow strain, as Walter Scott put it when he spoke on the death of Jane Austen. These are the books that seem to be um, uh, preferred by readers, or rather the literary environment seems to support such writing. So, where do you see the place of writing, you know, a personal um, story on a small, ca an introspective book? And how have you brought through your ideology and politics in your novels? Could you just speak about it? Can you hear me? No, I knew there's something wrong with this thing. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, thank you, Usha, for that in introduction. Uh, quite brief, I, I like it. And I think the truest thing you said there is that I take my writing seriously, but I don't take myself very seriously. And I think that really is what is true about me. Thank you for that. Now, about this uh, big themes and small themes, you know, each writer has her or his own way of presenting uh, piece of fiction, uh, any narrative for that matter. And my way is not to take the big themes. Now, actually, uh, even Tolstoy in War and Peace had sort of two very different sections. One was War and one was Peace. And in one, he, he had the generals and Napoleon and Alexander and the emperor and all of them and what was happening between them. And on the other hand, he had these families and all their lives. And I think that to me is really what uh, fiction is about, it is about the tangential connections for me that matter. You know, we not directly impacted by history, not all of us. Some may be when, you know, there's a war or something like that. But for most of us, like for independence came to India, partition happened, but for people like us living in the South, it didn't matter very much because we went through the usual things. There was a sense of freedom. We had the national flag, we had ceremonies, functions, but otherwise, it was not like it was in the north. So there was no direct thing, but then there is an impact. And I think that's what interests me, the impact of, because fiction is about people. Fiction is not about events. Fiction is about what happens to people, not what events happen. So the events are there only as they affect their life. And I'm happy with that, I'm comfortable with that. And if the big novel uh, is given, you know, more importance, so be it. You know, we can't all write the way uh, literary trends want us to write. We all have to write our own way. So, um, you know, Walter Scott put it very rightly, you know, he said about Jane Austen that she knows how to do the small, you know, I forget that, sensitive, whatever. And he said he, he does the big bow wow strain. And he says, I can do it as well as anyone, but I can't write like her. So I think the two kinds of writing, and I am not for the big bow wow strain, that's all. Hello, can you hear me? 
Very good, I see nods out there. Uh, I'm very honored to be here on stage with Vivek Usha and of course uh, with Shashi Deshpande, uh, an author who I have great respect for. Um, I have uh, written a, a book on Shashi's work and uh, I've actually maybe taken on what Shashi has just said. I think her novels are about big things. So I'm gonna contradict our author with great respect and say that uh, Shashi's novels do engage, I think, very uh, actively with social and political events in a, a similar way to, uh, to other novels. I, I just think that needs to be said. That's not my question, though. So uh, what I want to do is I want to start with uh, a reading from the memoir, which I've had the privilege of reading. I'll start here with this from Listen to Me. I believe that stories are born from individual memories. Collective memories create history. Narratives define civilizations. Toni Morrison's words, indeed they do. I, Shashi, was born before India's independence. I was a girl during the first decade of euphoria in our country after independence. I witnessed the Nerivian years of socialism, of a struggle to create a country out of very disparate elements. These were, nevertheless, years of optimism. Later there became the beginning of corruption, the threat of tyranny, of war, and times of hardship. And in recent times there has been a fear of the failure of the kind of democracy our constitution makers had envisaged. All of these things have gone into my novels, not directly narrated, for I am a fiction writer, but as the background to the lives of my characters. Or rather, the times have emerged through the lives of people, of my characters, Without the context of those times, my characters' lives will remain incomplete. And I would say that the memoir is a way of, of addressing what formed uh, Shashi Deshpande's writing. Um, and when I think about what, what is said here, I think about descriptions of living in Mumbai, which reminded me so much of some of the narrative in That Long Silence. And similarly, when I read a novel like The Country of Deceit, I can see how much a girlhood in Darwood um, informed that novel and several others. And yet, as you say, Shashi, your novels are not direct narrations of your life. In writing your memoir, how did you balance the need to divulge things that are very personal? I know you're a very private person. Um, and your desire to shed light on your work. Uh, the blurb says that I'm famously reticent. I think that reticence has been completely shattered by this book because I realized I, I wrote a first draft and I showed it to my editor Kartika and Kartika just asked me one question, so just made one comment, but you're not in this because I had kept myself out. I didn't want to be present like, I don't want to be, you know, kind of sitting on stage like this and to write about yourself is to be like sitting on stage. So I kept myself out and she said, then why are you writing this? And then I rewrote the whole thing and then I had to think of, am I going to say some things which are very private? So There's one thing which I was very clear about. I'm not going to write anything which will hurt somebody else. You know, if it's a private about me and my life and I have the right to say it, I will say it if it is relevant, not otherwise. And if it is about somebody else's life, I will not. So I have a little bit about my parents. My father had a very difficult time. He gave up his job on principles and nearly for five years he had no job. Those were the days when jobs were almost impossible to get. He was a great scholar, he was a dramatist, but he could not get a job. And it was a terrible life for him with three children. So do I write about that? Do I share my parents' poverty and the kind of needy life we had to live? I had to think a lot about that. So two reasons uh, convinced me. One is that when I started writing and when that long silence was published, somebody wrote a review of three novels, my long silence and two other novels. Well, all of them were women. And the heading was um, something about clubs, um, ladies club, a ladies club. And I was so angry. I mean, what makes you think that women who are writing are all part of a very elite group? And I am supposed to be writing in English, therefore the presumption is that you belong to a, a very upper class, which is not true anyway, and even less true today because English writing has been tremendously democratized. I don't know how many uh, people realize the kind of various people who are writing in English now, which didn't happen before. 
So I wanted to make it clear that an English writer need not come from a privileged background. I came from a background where there was want, there was need, there were difficulties. My parents struggled to keep us in school. I think uh, somebody told my father, you let them stay at home for a year. And he said, no, I will not. And we had lots of problems, monetary problems. And nevertheless, we were, we were happy. We were free, you know, living in Dharwad. I think that is what Dharwad has given me, life of total freedom. And as far as I'm concerned, for me, two things are important in life. One is freedom and one is other is dignity. So it was not a hardship for me at all to face that. I wanted to make that clear that everybody who writes in English, especially if you're a woman, you're supposed to be living a life of luxury. I remember a man who came to me out of nowhere and said, Anita Desai sits in the drawing room and writes while her husband struggles to earn the money. And I thought, where is he getting that from? Who told him that, you know? I remember for once I was very rude and I just turned my back on him and walked away. And I'm so glad I did that. So I wanted to dispel that illusion. The other thing is, I think certain honesty is required. Certain honesty is required in any writing, and especially in um, you know writing uh, something about yourself. But like I said, not something which will hurt other people. I mean, um, Imran Khan's third wife, I think, wrote a book in which she sort of exposed a lot of nasty things about him. I think that's obnoxious. And then uh, there's also uh, Paul Thiro who wrote about Nepal. I mean, these are all big people, so nobody says anything, but to me it was distasteful. And uh, Padma Lakshmi about Salman Rushdie, I think you can't carry your private vendettas into the public, and especially when the other person cannot respond. So, uh, you know, I had to make a decision. Certain things I've still not said, I had to keep away. And like I said, there's a lot of things about a writer's mind, the envy, which I do not want to speak about. All writers are extremely envious of other writers. It's not a continuing state of envy, but somebody gets a good review and you oh God, why am I not getting that kind of... Somebody's book sells well, oh God, why am I not selling? You know, these are all momentary, but they're there. We cannot deny that, and I do not want to deny that I have had these moments too. So, uh, they pass. So, you know, I decided that I will be as frank as I can be uh, without hurting any people. Something about my brother, which I asked my sister's permission, even about my father, I asked my sister's permission because she's the only other one left. So I'm okay with that. She said, you are free to write, and I said, sure, then it's okay. Oh. I spent all of yesterday reading this book. And I was telling her uh, this morning that I spent the whole day with her. I was in Dharwad, I was in Mumbai, I was in Bangalore, I was in London. I mean, what a wonderful experience it was. And, uh, you know, something I must say about this book, the tone of this book, it's like, you know, that she was sitting next to me and, and telling me it is a very tender tone. Maybe you did it after uh, Katika's feedback, I don't know. But then it was really like, you know, uh, talking to a friend and telling me so many things and that was a wonderful thing. The other thing which really struck me is the joy of intellectual pursuit, which I could see in every chapter and how hungry you were for books and, and what you did. And also the book is not just about I, me, myself. The whole book is studded with so many quotes and also there are so many people, there are so many writers, so many books, so many experiences. So it was like, you know, really moving around you know, you taking me around and, and introducing me to your friends, your writers, books, your family. It was such a wonderful writing and, and thank you so much for that and congratulations for this. And when I, there's something that uh, also struck me is your emotional world is formed, you know, by Kannada and Marathi, you know, which, which I could clearly see and, and you have also written about it and you write in English. I want to know what kind of challenges were there, were there any challenges at all? And sometimes I was curious whether your characters, all of them, do they really speak in English always? Or do they speak sometimes in Marathi, sometimes in Kannada, sometimes in English? Because the literature to you has come to you, you know, it has come to you in English, uh, right? Because that is how uh, it has come to you. Like for me, literature for me has come in Kannada, though my mother tongue is Konkani. So what were the challenges and what were the pleasures of doing it? What did you, you know, discover as you write? 
Hello. Um, you know, when I began writing, can you hear? Yeah. When I began writing, it never even occurred to me I'm writing in English. It took me some time to realize that I'm writing in English. Because that was the only language I knew, so I was writing in the only language I knew and in which I could express myself. But all my uh, experiences, the emotional content were all from Kannada and Marathi. And uh, I was surrounded by the two languages. So it was a kind of, you know, tripartite thing in, at home. Like my father in Kannada, my mother in Marathi. And we children spoke to each other mostly in English. And all my intellectual work was in English. But all my emotional thing was in uh, Marathi. Not even Kannada. Because it was from my mother that I got Marathi. So when my children were small, I spoke to them exclusively in Marathi. It's very strange how we use language. We are not even conscious that we are doing these things, you know, that we are separating. So when I started writing, it was English. And um, there are challenges like uh, Vivek says, but I was not conscious of them until much later, very much later. It was only when I started writing a novel that I saw some glaring discrepancies in the book. Like, I you know, I wrote uh, about an uneducated couple who, who the husband is beating the wife, this is in Mumbai, under Jaya's window. And the woman says, mother, mother. And later I looked at it and said, what mother, mother? How can I say mother? Would that Marathi knowing slum woman say mother, mother? But what do I say else in English? But if I were to write it later, which I did, I would say, I go, I go. You know. So I think I learned in the process of writing about what you can, language you can use, in what context. And I'm very clear about what languages my characters speak. There's no question at all. And I also make it clear. I remember when I was writing The Binding Wine, I made the family have three languages like I have. There's Marathi, there's Gujarati, there's Kannada. So all the three languages are used. And I was trying to sort of, you know, say every time this is in Marathi, this is in Kannada. But it was stupid. It didn't work. So ultimately, I just left it and made very indirect references to the languages. And I think that is where the skill of the writer comes in. That you say things without saying them. You let the reader know things without saying them. And that is what I think you learn as you write. It doesn't come right away. As Usha will also know that, you know, our own languages are there. So Usha always writes Annasaru, you know. I mean, I have seen uh, Arke Narayan saying rice and uh, lentil soup. And rice and lentil soup doesn't give me the same feeling like Anna Saru gives. I know what Anna Saru is. I don't know what rice and lentil soup is. So, you know, I think he, he had to go through that. Like, I had to go through my mistakes to come to a point where I would do it better. Indian writers in English had to go through that kind of a writing to come to a point. Today's writers are totally unselfconscious. So, I used to look down upon the Indian English writers as to say, I won't write like them. I don't want to write like Manohar Malgaonkar, I don't want to write like Narayan, I certainly don't want to write like Raja Rao, you know, I mean, it was kind of, I was not young, I was more than 30 then, but even then, I had that kind of obstinacy. And now I know that they had to write that way, so that Indian writers in English could reach where we are today. So I think that for me was a great revelation, as much a revelation as my own writing was to me. I have a connected question with that. Um, which, uh, in fact, you've uh, um, stirred something there about uh, Indian writing in English. Uh, I have, I mean, there are actually two questions. Uh, you describe your position in Indian writing in English as an alien insider, a phrase that was first used by uh, Professor P. Lal, and which you say that fits you to a T. Uh, first, uh, could you tell us a little more? And then... Um, taking off from what uh, Vivek said and the answer you gave, um, you said that um, when you were doing your MA, you read uh, F. R. Leavis's The Great Tradition, and I'll read a little bit from uh, the memoirs. And you found this statement right at the beginning. The great English novelists are Jane Austen, George Eliot, Henry James, and Joseph Conrad. Leavis also says, Jane Austen is the inaugurator of the great tradition of the English novel. 
while i marveled at the certainty with which he said these things his statements made it clear that indian in english writing had no place in the literary world he was speaking of you go on to say that you attended a seminar in cambridge and that is when you realize that much as you admire jane austen i mean you do we all do i too am uh, an austenite but it you suddenly realize that having a common language is not enough and you say there were no models for me to follow so this reflects the predicament of the indian writer in english in many ways we read writers who have written originally in english and then we realize that a common language is just not enough um, give we know very well that we've had the complex relationship with english we have a colonial history so what would you say who would you say your forebears were um can you speak about this a little um you know there was a time when they asked me what are your influences and i said you know stain charlotte bronte um, you know emily bronte and all that and then later i thought my god that's not true because uh, i think like uh, usha said the seminar in cambridge told me clearly we don't belong here i mean we were very proud that arke narayan was praised by graham green we are very proud when we are published abroad etc but we do not belong there that was extremely clear to me and i had no problems at all of sort of not being part of that you know i mean lewis made it very clear and uh, you know i admired lewis statement about jane austen but there's much else i don't uh, agree with so this influence thing even hard of a woman when i began writing there were scarcely any women who had written in english i mean there were kamla markandeya uh, anita they said just begun um, she's my contemporary in age but she ra- began writing much earlier uh, nantara segal uh, ruth pravel chawala now ruth pravel chawala and kamla markandeya i would completely disown nothing to do with me their writing i was very clear about that later also nantara segal and you know uh, anita they say they were not women oriented i did not find the woman's voice there whereas my novels from the word go my short stories clearly had a woman's voice so even the language of a woman is difficult to get i mean you do not have uh, you know the same kind of language as a man i think it's now academics have sort of i suppose uh, sort of found that out and we also realize when we talk that we do not speak the same language like i open my cover and say oh god i have nothing to wear and my husband will say you got 200 sarees there what do you mean both of us are right you know it's true that i when i say i have nothing to wear there i mean something specific so we have different languages so man's language was not what i would be able to use i had to use my own language i had to literally create my own language and that i did particularly in the first two novels uh, second and third novel dark holes no terrors and that long silence and i think for me those were really the testing grounds where i used the english language for my ex- for the experiences of an indian woman who did not belong to a class who ordinarily spoke english i mean i'm very clear about the kind of people who speak english and to people who do not now of course a lot of people more people speak english than ever before the irony after partition but i to me it was very clear that women's language is different most women's language is not english and therefore especially the kitchen language you know or the language with children however good you are with english most women would speak baby talk in their own languages so this way these way the challenges we make more than you know uh, thinking about how do i uh, the language was a challenge it was a great challenge but i was happy to encounter it and to engage with it because i i i, I think like you said intellectual things are sort of you know very dear to my heart and this was something i loved kind of dealing with somewhere you make a very important remark about uh, you know the carelessness with which uh, some of the writers today use the language can you just say something more about this yeah i think the, um, this uh, contemporary writers in english i think i've been told i've read some is there's a lot of carelessness about language it's sort of chalta hai 
you know, after all, our readers also don't know English very well, so what does it matter? Why should we write very high funda English, which they will not understand anyway? And to me, that is very obnoxious. It is like dumbing down language. You know, you can't insult your reader like that. Your reader, for all you know, is extremely clever and taking note of all the mistakes you have made in your language. So I think language is a, for every writer, it is the tool, you know. Like every profession has its tool. Language is our tool. And we have to respect it. We have to work hard at it. We have to, you know, give it much more importance uh, than anyone else because it matters. And I almost sometimes feel I'd like to go on a crusade and say, you know, please take care of your language. It's so important. Millions of years before we reach this point, are we going to abandon it and just go back to pictures again? You know, icons and pictures and, you know, short forms and oh, they're all fine, but that should not be the only thing we have. So, uh, you know, language for me is uh, almost a sacred thing, I think. I want to follow that up. I know there are probably aspiring writers out there, and so I want to read something from the memoir that really struck me. This is how Shashi, I think, writes. Control, yet passion. Control in the crafting. Passion in the emotions. Irregular fire. Easy to say, but hard to practice. And it takes ages to learn. And for me, the intensity was very important. I could never glide on the surface. I had to drown myself, lose myself in the character's feelings, emotions. And that strikes me about your writing, Shashi, is that while there is passion and you write about love, you write about mature love, and you write about love of, of mother and child, father and child, but there is that control that guides it. And also I think the reading that you've done, the vast reading that you've done, inhabits that control. You have selected some of the finest examples in the English language, and you write, uh, you don't model yourself on them, but you've learned from them. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I, you know, I'm very happy Nancy brought this up because sometimes I ask myself often, why am I doing this? Why am I writing this? Like I said, it began with Kartika. She read a little piece of uh, mine in a magazine and it was about provincial uh, life and I wrote about Dharwad and how it was when we were young. And she read it and said, you know, you should write about yourself because you have a very interesting background. You don't have a... She didn't say that actually, but I suppose she meant it that you don't have a very privileged upper class background and uh, come from a small town, etc. So I thought it over and I said, maybe there's something and a lot of things I wanted to say about English, Indian writing in English. A lot of things I wanted to say which nobody has touched uh, about how women's writing is looked at. That is the sorest point in me. And none of them thankfully have touched that because I would never stop talking otherwise. You would be here until tomorrow listening to me, you know, sort of. <laughs> Uh, saying nasty things about all the critics who said nasty things about women's writing. So, uh, you know, that was really the, uh, the thing that I wanted to, you know, say, well, this is one of the, you know, things which uh, always hurts me, that women's writing has been always regarded as marginal, as, uh, you know, subordinate to male writing. And uh, Vivek said, you know, surprising, I write in Konkani, but nobody asked me, why do you write in, I read, I'm a Konkani person, Nobody asked me, why do you write in Kannada? But I'm always asked, why do you write in English? Perhaps because I don't belong to the class which used to write in English. But even worse than that is that every time the question, is your next novel also about women? And I was thinking, what are you saying, you know? Is it a bad habit? Is it a vice that I should give it up? You know, I mean, I just don't understand these people who say that. So I really got a big, huge boulder on my shoulder, not even a chip, uh, about this women's writing in English. And I think this book gave me a chance to say that loudly, angrily, and I've said that. So the other thing is, it gave me a chance to talk about all the writers I admired, all the writers I loved, and quote some of their things, because it's such beautiful things which writers have said. And I think, you know, People who don't read now, I think, are very unfortunate because there's such beauty in the language and such wonderful things, you know, the poetry, the prose. I mean, I'm also talking of Indian writing, regional writing, which thankfully I can now read in English, a lot of translators. I can, I've read Marathi in the original, I can barely read, but I do read Kannada in the original. So, you know, it doesn't matter what language it is. There's a beauty in language, there's a beauty in creative writing, and I wanted to say that. 
I have one question before um, uh, we turn it over to the audience. Maybe uh, Vivek. Yeah, this is um, one one question. I'm sure the audience will love it too. Uh, Shashi, in your memoir, you you described yourself as an ambitionless girl, content to drift, wanting nothing so much as to be left to myself. So you really didn't see yourself as, uh, you know, your name in the limelight and, uh, you know, a, a, a writer, of more, one of the foremost writers in the country. And this same girl, later on in the book, you say, I used the typewriter, a giant size Remington, in my husband's office in the evenings after his secretary left. The office was just above the mortuary and the autopsy room and the smell of death and formalin wafted up from the basement. I don't think I paid much attention to these morbid things, focused as I was on typing out what I had written. I did this until I got a second-hand portable Olivetti of my own for rupees 300, which seemed a great luxury. So how did that shy girl transform into such a determined writer? What is it that the writing life gave you that made you so determined? I, that was my life's work and uh, I think as I went on in life I, I met uh, writing and that became my as much my life as my family was so that's it you know and you know until you read this I never even remembered that there was a smell of death and formalin I was completely unaware of that it was just under where we were sitting so it's very hard to say I think I've spoken about finding your own work and this was my work that's it, you know. You're lucky if you find your own work. Not many people do. Uh, we have about, uh, we have a few minutes for uh, audience questions. I wonder if there's anybody to hand the mic. Uh, what do you uh, think of the writing that contemporary uh, Indian women writers like Arundhati Roy, uh, you know, have engaged in, basically? How do you relate to that? And uh, what uh, do you feel about that? I don't think Arundhati Roy would be ever describe herself as a woman writer. She is a phenomenon, I think, and we leave it at that. And I don't have to relate to it. I, I don't believe in this woman writer thing at all very honestly. And I'm quite offended that uh, women are put in a separate class. And we don't all write in the same way. We don't all write about the same thing. Recently, I had an invitation to inaugurate a women writers conference. And I said, I'm not coming. And I didn't say. But I thought, when you have a men writers conference, I'll come. You know? But there will never be a men writers conference. So. Uh, <clears throat> my question is to Shashi ma'am, uh, taking off on what Vivek said, that your writing, that your emotional space is non-English, however you write in English, and you write it without even thinking about it. Now, you must also understand that since you're writing in English, your readership is not necessarily restricted to the Indian readers. Do you find yourself as a writer struggling to or rather uh, go an extra mile to contextualize some of the very Indian things. Because I have seen writers of both forms, some who kind of make a little bit of a translation about what they said, and some who don't bother. So do you uh, go or try or maybe feel that you need to go an extra mile to contextualize a very Indian thing for your global audience? You know, I presume my readers, where they are, are intelligent. So I don't need to do anything for them. And number two, I think no writer ever thinks of readers. I mean, no writer who's a real writer. Uh, there are two writers here and they will agree with me. You never think of your readers when you are writing. The readers come into the picture after the book is published. And even then, it's not your business. It's the publisher's business to sell it to the right readers. I have nothing to do with that. So I don't think I've ever thought of readership never thought of readership even in India. So there's no question of my thing of readership outside India. Uh, 
Well, was your husband an inspiration for your writing? How much did he cooperate? How much did he encourage? Well, he's not an inspiration and uh, he, well, he sort of encouraged me a lot and I think it's very important to me. He's always my first reader and he's, when I finish a book, I always give it to him and he never says anything, which is why we are still married. You know, otherwise <laughs> our marriage would have been, you know. And my second question is, when you meet people and you observe them, do you convert them into characters in your story? No, no. None of your relatives no, no, figure no, in? No, 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 it's not so direct as that. Oh, no, thank it's you. It's very indirect. Um, hi, Shashima. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask how difficult or easy it was for you to chronicle your memories from childhood. In one way, it was a pleasure. You know, especially the very early memories. And it's amazing how many things I realized I remembered, which I never thought I remembered. So it was lovely writing about childhood. Afterwards, it was a little harder. You know, when you become an adult and you have a lot of complicated feelings within you and a lot of anger in me, especially in the early years when I could not, I was just a housewife, as they say, and spent all my time was spent in looking after my children. The anger was not against the children, but against the way I had to sort of give up everything but that. All those things would be very hard to put on paper and I tried not to be very dishonest, that's all. <laughs>